So let's talk about that. Faraday's law. Which you have learned in physics in a more elegant form than a simple circuit relationship that I've put in here. Faraday's law <coughs> says that the path integral around a closed path L, which I did denote as a, a little circle just to denote that that's closed. If we add up E along that path integral, uh, counting up all the contributions that are collinear with that path, that's what this means, and we put a minus sign in front of it, that's what voltage is. Or voltage is always measured between two points. In this case, we're actually going around and, and going back to the place that we started from. I have a minus sign because voltage is actually minus. Uh, oh, electric field is actually minus the gradient of voltage. Then this should be equal to the change with respect to time. So I'm going to write partial derivative with respect to time of the flux around that surface. So magnetic flux is B. I got to dot it with my perpendicular element of integration. And we can see what's happening here. You pick up closed path, L. You got a surface inside, S. And if you count all the magnetic flux that goes through there and look at the change with respect to time, you'll get the total voltage around the path. That's all that's saying. Very elegant mathematical way to, to write it. And that's actually what Faraday's law is in integral form. In integral form. So usually when you see it, they commute the negative sign to the other side of the equation. They put it over here. If the geometry of your scenario is not changing, then you can often take this time derivative and just move it inside the integral. If the field itself is changing, but your path and all of your material constructs around that path are not changing, you can do that. Otherwise, you've got to leave it out there when you compute it. So let's say, so, so yeah, that's, this is the integral form. Let's try to get the differential form and fill in one of those boxes. If I have a path integral of any field, regardless of what it is, in this case it happens to be E field, and I'm integrating it around a closed path. How can I re-express this precisely using Stokes' theorem? Well, Stokes' theorem says I can commute a path integral to a surface integral, where the surface is enclosed by that path, any surface enclosed by that path. I've got to div dot it with that perpendicular surface element of integration that's always normal. So I put an N there that's to denote that it's normal. And what do I dot with that in Stokes' theorem? What do I have to do to complete that mathematical relationship? If E is my field, Stokes' theorem says this should be the curl. Did you say curl? Yeah. Good. Good. Curl of E. And again, this is true for any vector, not just electric field. It's a mathematical property, not a physical property. OK. Well, then, let's say that everything is constant. My surfaces are constant. My material uh, presence is constant. And I can actually take that negative partial derivative 
with respect to time inside the integral of the surface. This is dealing with the integral form of, of, MP, of uh, Faraday's law. In that case, I'm going to be taking the time derivative with respect to that flux density vector. And I'm doing that same kind of normal flux integral over a surface, counting up all the contributions. And what we're saying is that this integral must be equal to this integral for any surface that you pick. It doesn't matter whether it's a flat disk, it doesn't matter with it, if it's a wavy diaphragm looking thing, if it's a sphere, if it's a, or a hemisphere. As long as you can draw a line around it, whatever surface, a line around the edge, no matter how wavy or messed up, that surface integral should produce this result. And if that's true for any shape, for these two field quantities, then the integrands must be equal. And this is the differential or point form of Faraday's law. Very elegant. It's an elegant equation, but what does it mean? This is the swirliness of the electric field. How much is it circulating in a region of space? Is it being spun up, which means it's going to have a high curl? And by the right-hand rule, the direction of that curl vector will point in the direction that's spinning it up, about which it's circulating. If it's a low value or a zero value, that means that the electric field is, is just kind of spreading out or collapsing. It's not swirling. What does electric field swirl around? Well, before things were changing, it, all, it never swirled around anything. The curl was always zero. But in electrodynamics, this is how you know you've entered a, an electrodynamic situation. Your magnetic field is changing. If the magnetic field is changing, you no longer have curl of E equals to zero. E field will actually swirl around a changing magnetic flux. That doesn't sound all that impressive, but that has enormous applications in everyday life. It enables everything cool that we do. Anything with a motor in it is based on this relationship, or a generator, right? Uh, well, a DC motor is, a, is probably the best example. They all kind of involve changing magnetic fields in some way, any type of motor that you deal with. But a DC motor is probably the most easiest one to grasp. How does a DC motor work? Uh, or a, a, oh, I should say, uh, uh, I think the best example to, to show at this point is the, an AC generator, because that's pretty easy to understand in terms of this law, right? What are you doing when you have uh, an AC generator, like at your power plant? Well, you got some big DC permanent magnets on the rotor, right? And they've got a magnetic field coming out. And there's something driving that rotor, steam engine or what have you. And where does that steam come from? You're burning coal, you're heating it up with nuclear material, you're burning natural gas. Whatever you're doing, you're making steam and you're pushing it through that turbine and you're twisting that rotor around. And when that big DC magnet in the rotor swipes over a coil of wires, what does that coil of wires see? Well, the magnetic field through that coil goes up and then it goes down. And that means that for a brief time, the change of that flux will make a voltage around that coil. 
Well, as it's going up, that voltage will be positive. And then as that rotor, as that magnetic field leaves, it will go negative and positive and then negative and then positive and negative. 60 times per second. All directly piped into your uh, power outlet into your home. It's really the source of all the electricity that we get is based on that simple Faraday law relationship. Very little direct conversion. I guess solar is a good example of something that doesn't use Faraday's law directly. directly. So here's where we put it in. This is actually going to be equal to minus electric uh, magnetic flux density change with respect to time. And this is the basics of motors. This is a, a, a fundamental attribute of the, the circuit element of an inductance, where you have uh, voltage is equal to L d i d t. What that means is that there's going to be a certain amount of current momentum through an inductor. You send a current through a coil of wires, or even just a regular wire itself. There's going to be a magnetic field around there. And there's going to be a certain degree of momentum, so that if you try to change that magnetic field, it's going to try to keep pushing current through there to maintain it, because there's energy stored in that magnetic field. You can't go from 0 to, zero to 60 instantaneously. And that's another ramification of this. So this is just the basics of Faraday's law. Uh, what we will do when we come back on Thursday, we have a fun lecture. We'll maybe work an example with Faraday's law or talk about some applications. And then we use Faraday's law to construct a model of mutual inductance. And by the end of the class, you will figure out how to ride the MARTA for free. OK? Well, yeah, I guess, I guess you could climb under the gate. I'm talking about electromagnetically free. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> you can do it for free. You only need $20,000 of test and measurement of RF equipment. Once you've got that and when you've made that investment, the rest will be free. Relatively free. You'll probably need to service it every once in a while for a few thousand dollars.